Welcome to the Organic Crop Insurance webinar, uh, Organic Crop Insurance 101, hosted by the Organic Agronomy Training Service. This event is being recorded and will be posted online. I am Mallory Krieger, National Program Director with OATS. OATS is a collaboratively managed training program for agricultural professionals working with organic and transitioning farmers in the United States. We seek to grow domestic organic production by strengthening the educational support network of agronomists, certified crop advisors, extension agents, and technical service providers. Our aim is for every transitional and certified organic farmer to have robust access to technical service expertise to provide unbiased science-based agronomic support for their farming operation. Um, next slide, please. If you would like to keep up to date with events and happenings at OATS, um, we do have a mailing list that I recommend that you subscribe to. I'm going to drop the, the link in the chat. Um, you will get uh, email notifications of upcoming opportunities like this webinar. Um, we have some great programs ongoing on many topics. Um, for one, you can listen into our monthly organic advisor call series. Next slide, please where we interview farmers and experts or join in the discussions at our organic advisor listserv. We are currently enrolling participants, next slide please, um, in the organic field crop course, which is a training program for ag professionals who want to better serve organic field crop farmers. Enroll by March 20th to secure your spot in the next class. In addition to today's webinar on organic crop insurance, OATS is also developing a podcast series exploring the ins and outs of crop insurance for organic farmers. And we are also launching an online video-based course on organic crop insurance topics for ag advisors. I would like to thank um, the USDA Risk Management Agency for providing the funding to develop and host these organic crop insurance education programs. In today's webinar, we will begin with an introduction to federal crop insurance um, by USDA RMA organic specialist, Sarah Cleithermis, followed by a talk by organic crop insurance agent, Megan Vaith on specific programs available to producers in this region. We will have time at the end for questions and group discussion. If you have a question during the presentations, please drop it into the chat and I will be sure it gets answered. Sarah, would you tell us a little bit about RMA and the Federal Crop Insurance Program? Sure, thank you, Mallory. Uh, thank you all for joining today. I hope you really enjoy this presentation and, and learn a lot more about organic crop insurance. So like Mallory said, my name is Sarah Cleithermis. I am from Central Missouri. I've been working in the organic program for 13 years. I'll start my, or 14 years, I'll start my 15 years this summer. And uh, basically what I do is work in the uh, policy aspect of the program. I write a lot of the crop insurance policy and help with training for changes and uh, other program education like today. So the first slide here, this is just going to give you some stats on, on crop insurance with RMA. So as, as you can see, uh, crop insurance, what it does, it protects from naturally occurring weather events. So here's some statistics on flood and drought. That's mostly what we see in our book of business, but that's also going to include um, hail, ex extreme wet weather, there might be uh, frost, D there's different causes of loss that are covered. A uh, hurricane is one of them, um, high winds, something like a tornado or a derecho. So that's, that's really what crop insurance is for. And RMA's role is to serve as a regulator and reinsurer. And what RMA does is we work with legislators and congressmen to create crop insurance regulations and modifications to non-regulatory policies. So an example of this, a legislative or statutory change would be a farm bill. So farm bills, farm bill is coming up. We may see some program changes to crop insurance due to that. So it would be my job and others in, in my office to work to create uh, the best program we can within the, fine, the confines of that statute. An example of an administrative funding change would be 
uh, the traditional and organic grower assistance program that that is going to come up later in this conversation. So those are some of the changes that I work with to to work on the organic program for for producers. A little bit more about the crop insurance program. Private insurance companies have a standard reassurance agreement with RMA, and then they sell and service the program to the farmer customers. So it, it's not uh, folks like me who are doing the work with the boots on the ground. It is uh, crop insurance companies, agents, loss adjusters, and folks like that. So they really have the boots on the ground to administer the program. Uh, the last bullet here, it has some statistics on our program. So um, since 2000, we have grown to $190 billion in liability. So that, that's one thing that's really grown over the past, uh, since I've even joined crop insurance. The, we have just insure more and more crops every year and make advancements to our programs. Next slide, please. So I, I, I lightly touched on roles and responsibilities of RMA. So what I do, I would fall into the first bullet. I develop policy, policy terms. Um, we also have new products and program expansion. I did mention that a little bit in the last slide. We collect data uh, for the program so that we can uh, make, make changes as we need to for those. We also have an auditing and oversight of finances and market behavior. There's a section we have a compliance portion and also um, folks in, in um, you know, like I said, finances and market behavior. I can't think of the branches of those folks right now, so you'll excuse me. Uh, we are a primary reinsurer, and I mentioned that in the previous slide. And uh, one of the part of that agreement is to compensate insurance companies. So that's within that. Thank you. The next slide, this explains what the insurance company's roles are. We, we work with them to, they're going to sit to sell the products. They're going to work the claims. Uh, there's quality control within each of the approved insurance provider companies. And uh, the big part that they have is they are going to assume the risk uh, for program integrity. And also within this insurance company uh, bucket is going to be the crop insurance agent. And the crop insurance agent is going to get out there and physically sell this, sell this product and educate producers and farmers. And they're going to be the face of the program. And they will often have multiple insurance companies that they write for. So the insurance company bullet I have above, for example, an insurance company uh, might be uh, Rain and Hail or a Great American. And the crop insurance agent might sell and service for both of those companies. Next slide, please. So now for the farmer, what's, what's their role in this? Well, they would purchase a policy that would work best for their farming operation. They're going to need to provide production history uh, to, to support their um, approved production history database to, to build uh, their crop insurance policy. They're also going to plant and report their acreage so that they can set their uh, appropriate premium for their policy for the coming year. And, and I mentioned premium, they're also going to pay that when they get the bill. And if there is a loss, they're going to provide a notice of loss to their crop insurance agent within an appropriate time period so they can get their, their uh, loss paid and worked. And lastly, I, I mentioned that already, then they would receive their loss payment. So this is a neat slide. I wanted to share this share this with everyone because it really shows the growth of the program over the years. I mentioned it in a bullet previously, but this is a really good picture of 2013 and going full circle into 2022. And you can see the growth of the policies that we have had in organic industry and also the acreage growth. 
And this slide, I, I really like this too, because it breaks it down by the top commodities insured. You can see uh, one through 10, starting with corn and ending in citrus fruit. And it also includes the acres liability and premium for those as well. So for your area, if, if there is um, a particular crop that you work with, you might find it here in, in some of these statistics. And th this, this slide also has a, a little blurb here that producers have purchased organic coverage for over 70 crops. Well, RMA does offer organic and organic transitional on almost all of our crop offers. So if, if you do have an organic crop, it may not be one of these top 10, but we do include uh, an insurance offer for, for almost all crops. Uh, so thank you, Mallory. I'm going, going to go ahead and kick it over to Megan. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, so like Mallory said, my name is Megan Baith and I own Northbourne Organic Crop Insurance. So in Sarah's um, talk about the roles of agents and insurance companies and all that, I am under the agent category. So I'm the one with the boots on the ground talking to the farmers about what their crop insurance options are. And so today I am collaborating with Oats to talk to all of you about what crop insurance options farmers have, especially in the organic sector. So today we're going to talk about initially crop insurance 101, how does a crop insurance policy work, and then some insurance options that are available for organic producers that might be beneficial to them, some recent crop insurance changes that happened over the last couple of years, and then the transitional and organic grower assistance program, which we're pretty excited about. So crop insurance 101, what is crop insurance and how does it work? Sarah already touched a little bit on this, but crop insurance is there to protect you against any sort of natural peril, which a lot of times is a weather related event. Like she touched on excess moisture or drought. It could be hail, um, flood, any sort of natural event that happens along with a revenue loss if you have a revenue protection policy. So that could come into play too. There are coverage options available for farmers from 50% all the way up to 85% in 5% increments. So this gives farmers a lot of different options on where they need insurance at versus where the guarantee is to make sure that they're covering all their input costs. The premium subsidies vary by level of coverage. So crop insurance is federally subsidized. So the farmer isn't having to pay the full premium. So this chart on the bottom shows the subsidy level that each coverage level and unit structure is um, covering at. And so I'd say the majority of farmers are either under optional units or enterprise units. But if we wanna look at that enterprise unit category and then look over to a common coverage level, maybe 75%, we can see that that has a 77% subsidy, which means that the farmer is only paying 23% of the crop insurance premium. So it is fairly highly subsidized. Crop insurance policies are available by crop and by county. So this gives farmers a little bit of flexibility to insure one crop and not another if they choose so, or maybe have different coverage levels between the crops or different counties if they farm in multiple counties. Why is crop insurance important? Why are we talking about it today? Why do we wanna make sure everybody is aware of it? Crop insurance realistically is one of the only input costs on your operation that can actually guarantee you some sort of dollar revenue in the end. You can plant seed, put down fertilizer, but if disaster strikes and you have no yield left at harvest, you're not going to receive any revenue back on those input costs, but on crop insurance you will because you are guaranteed a certain amount of revenue. So this is a calculation of how a basic crop insurance policy will work. On the left, you can see our bushel guarantee where we start with an approved yield of 200 bushels per acre. And this is an example for corn. Um, so in this example, this farmer was had a proven history of 200 bushels per acre, meaning over the last 10 years, his average yield was around 200 bushels. You take that multiplied your, by your coverage level, which is 80%. And this example is a very common coverage level to get a bushel guarantee of 160 bushels. So for this farmer, if he's harvesting in the fall, and receives less than 160 bushels per acre, he will trigger a claim. Then on the right side shows how you can calculate the revenue guarantee on the revenue side of things. You take that 160 bushel guarantee and then multiply it by the crop insurance price, which this is as of 2022 was 1172 to get your guaranteed revenue of $1,875. 
So if this farmer had a complete disaster and there was no yield left at harvest time, he would collect that $1,875 per acre on his crop insurance policy. Now this example here shows how your crop insurance guarantee can change throughout the year depending on where the harvest price lies. Um, so we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but the crop insurance price is calculated two times in the year, once in the spring and once in the fall, and you could choose the higher of the two. And so the example on the left shows how your guarantee can change if you have a higher harvest price versus the original 1172. So what you do in that calculation is you just basically replace the original crop insurance price of 1172 to a new harvest price, which this example shows 1280 to get a new guaranteed revenue of $2,048. The example on the right shows how your crop insurance guarantee can change if that harvest price is actually lower. So how I like to calculate it is I take the original guarantee with the original revenue, original price that we had calculated in the spring, and then divide it by the harvest price. And this gives us a new bushel guarantee of 174 bushel. So this calculation seems a little odd to some farmers, but realistically, if the price is lower, it now takes more bushels on your operation to come up with the same amount of revenue that you had originally had with the original price. So now your bushel guarantee really kind of gets a step up with the harvest price being lower. So revenue protection is the policy we just went over, which in my opinion is kind of like the premier crop insurance product that's available for farmers. And so a lot I get asked quite often, can I get revenue protection on all the crops on my operation? And it's always one of those answers where, well, maybe, it depends on the situation. So corn and soybean coverage is available in almost all areas across the US, whereas you get on a more specialized crops level, it is typically a county by county basis. So here shows a map from the risk management agency on where coverage is available on corn. And so all the green areas on this map shows where crop insurance coverage is readily available under revenue protection. And then the white areas is where crop insurance is not available without um, submitting written requests, which we'll talk about later, or other options for farmers. And then here shows the soybeans. So you can see that this still covers the majority of the US that's actually raising soybeans. So coverage is pretty easily accessible for these farmers. Oats is kind of the same situation where it's covering most of the state. But then you get into a little bit more specialized crop like sunflowers, where we're only seeing a strip of coverage down the middle of the US where farmers can readily get insurance options. And so it's really case by case and county by county as to where coverage is available and what kind of coverage options you have. So what options does a farmer have if coverage is not available for the crops that he's farming? I think we're all well aware that um, in organics, we typically have more crops in our rotation and some of them are more specialized where there's not a whole lot of history in that county and so coverage might not be available for them on those specialized crops. So the two main options a producer has if revenue protection is not readily available in their area are written agreements or whole farm revenue protection. Written agreements is basically the farmer and the agent requesting insurance coverage on that crop if the crop isn't available in that county. And so if you live in an area that and you're wanting to plant sunflowers that was white on the map, you could submit a written agreement in order to try to get insurance on your sunflowers in that county. These written agreements are due at sales closing, which is September 30th for most fall planted crops and March 15th for most spring planted crops. This could change on a crop by crop basis, but for the most part, that kind of covers the majority of them. Um, so the agent will work with the farmer to prepare the packet and submit it to the insurance company. This does requ require a lot of supporting documents, which we'll go over on the next slide. Um, but one main reason I really wanted to talk about it today is because in my opinion, this is really necessary in order to expand the crop insurance program in the future. And so I, I talked to a lot of farmers that are wondering why crop insurance coverage just isn't available for whatever crop they're trying to plant in their area. And a lot of times it's because the farmers are taking the crop uninsured and they're not submitting written agreements in order, in order to try to get insurance on them. So in my experience, when RMA is looking at expanding the crop insurance program and maybe offering specialized crop insurance in more counties, one of the first things they're going to look at is whether written agreements have been submitted in that county for that crop or not. And if nobody has submitted a written agreement to try to get insurance on that crop, 
it might show that there is no need for crop insurance. So I just think it's really necessary to start the process and request these written agreements to try to get crop insurance expanded into those counties to make it easier for farmers in the future. There are more options um, that RMA goes through whether to dis discover whether to expand the crop insurance program or not, but I feel like this is one of the main things. So here's a list of requirements that are um, required under written agreements. So when we submit these forms, we have to fill out what dates the crop is normally planted, the name, location, and approximate distance to the place of delivery. If the crop is irrigated, we have to list the main water source and the method of irrigation. And then the crop history is the one that usually makes farmers take a step back. So in order to prove a crop history, you must verify that you have at least three years of history on either the crop that you're requesting or a similar crop. And when I say similar crop, I don't mean like the farmer gets to select like, oh, I'm planting a different crop and I think it's similar. It is on an approved list from the written agreement handbook. And so you have to have a history of a, either the crop you're requesting or a similar crop from their handbook. If you don't have the history and you're farming in like an LLC type of operation and someone that has at least 10% ownership in the operation has the history, you can use that in order to qualify for the written agreement. A couple of the requirements are soil maps and a letter of adaptability from an egg expert, which a lot of times comes from a certified agronomist or a conservation specialist. Um, and here's a list of what an approved similar crop could look like for canola. And so here we see a bunch of different crops on the screen and all of these could be used as similar crops for canola or if you were trying to get a written agreement for dry peas, you would just flip flop the two in order to see what kind of requirements you need. So you need at least three years of history. That doesn't mean that it needs to be all the same crop. So a farmer could, if he was trying to get insurance on canola, submit a written agreement with one year of history of barley and two years of oats to qualify for his three years of history in order to submit the written agreement to try to get insurance. Here's a similar slide, but it shows the similar crops for sunflowers. So all of these would be able to count as similar crops for sunflowers. Whole farm revenue protection was the second option that I had talked about for farmers if crop insurance coverage was not available for them. And this kind of takes a whole different look on crop insurance compared to the revenue protection type policies that most farmers are used to. So instead of looking at yield and what yields you're going to harvest in the fall, this is all based on the overall revenue of your entire operation. So the guarantee is going to be based on the previous allowable revenue versus the expected revenue. So they're going to take the last five years of Schedule F tax farm information, average it together, and then you see what your average income was or allowable revenue based on the last five years and then compare it with, with what your expected revenue is for the coming year, they will take the lower of those two numbers and then multiply it by the coverage level that the farmer selects to get his guaranteed revenue for the year. So it's not at all based on yield, it's just on total revenue. Coverage options are available from 50% to 75% unless a farmer has three or more commodities on his farm. And if he has three or more, then he's able to purchase 80 and 85% coverage levels as well. This also will qualify him for a whole farm subsidy discount, um, which will just give him more crop insurance subsidy to make his premium a little bit less. What's really, really great about whole farm revenue protection is it covers almost any crop a farmer is going to produce. So it's really ideal for diverse farmers that maybe are planting crops that crop insurance is not available for. Um, or another option under whole farm revenue protection is you can kind of use it as an umbrella policy over your entire operation. So you could still purchase revenue protection on your corn, soybeans, oats, your main crops, and then still have this as another layer of protection over top of it. The biggest downsides to whole farm revenue protection are what typically scares farmers off is that there is quite a bit more paperwork involved in whole farm revenue protection compared to your traditional revenue protection crop insurance policy. And in order to even get a quote for a farmer as to what coverage might look like, you have to submit those five years of tax returns as kind of a starting point. And then there's a lot more tax or, or paperwork reporting as the year goes on. So that usually makes a lot of farmers shy away from it, but I don't think that's a, a cause of pause. I think it's still worth pursuing. 
um, but just to be aware that there's probably more involved in this than your standard crop insurance policy. The other thing that usually holds a farmer up is that the claims will be more delayed under whole farm revenue protection versus your standard crop insurance policy, where typically when you go to harvest the crop, if you trigger a loss, you're going to call your agent, file a claim, an adjuster will come out, and that process will be finished up fairly quickly. Well, here, since your revenue is all based on your tax returns, you won't be able to get paid out on a claim until your taxes are filed for that year. So instead of getting paid out in the fall, oftentimes you're looking at the next spring by the time you can receive your claim payment. Just something to be aware of. Contract pricing, in my opinion, is one of the biggest advantages that organic uh, farmers have when it comes to crop insurance. This allows a farmer to insure his crops at his own contracted price. So it's really one of the only ways to truly individualize your crop insurance coverage. So you can use your yield and your contracted price versus the RMA established price that would be typically used. So the RMA established price is based on the Board of Trade sales closing prices for the entire month of February to establish the spring price. So they look at the daily average closing price for the entire month of February, average it together, and that is the RMA established price. So we're all aware that um, organic crops are not traded on the Board of Trade. And so they're looking at the conventional crops and then multiplying them by a factor to give us the benefit of what value organic crops have. And so this year on corn, it is a factor of 1.878 times the conventional price and then 2.056 on soybeans. And so instead of using those RMA prices, farmers will be able to use their contracted price if they choose to. In order to use your contracted price, you have to have the special option on your policy by sales closing, which like we said, is oftentimes March 15th for spring crops. And then you have to submit the contract to your insurance agent by acreage reporting, which is most often July 15th. And so what I suggest farmers do is to have this option on their policy so that it's in place in case they want to use it. And so if a farmer doesn't have their contract by July 15th, or doesn't want to submit it because maybe their contracted price is lower than what the crop insurance price is, they just don't submit the contract and then you don't pay any extra premium for it since you're not using it. So I think it's really beneficial to just have on your policy just in case you want to use it. There is a clause in there that contract prices are capped. And so in corn it is capped at 1.5 times what the organic crop insurance price is set at on corn and then 1.75 times on soybeans. And oftentimes, farmers get contracts within that um, range of prices anyway that it doesn't really impact them too much. So here's an example on last year's crop prices on what this could have did for a farmer for his guarantee. So on the left, you can see that this farmer was able to get a guaranteed revenue of $1,315 based on the spring crop insurance price of $27.41. On the right, you can see that this farmer was able to get a contract for $38 a bushel on his soybeans. Because of that, and because he had the contract pricing option on his policy, submitted the contract to his agent by acreage reporting, he was able to substitute that $27.41 for $38 a bushel. This gave him a bump up in guaranteed revenue by over $500 per acre. And so this made a really large difference for farmers last year when claims were getting paid out um, due to drought or whatever type of loss they might've had where they were able to collect quite a bit more on their crop insurance policy because they used the contract pricing to their advantage. Beginning farmer rancher is not anything new. It's been in place for a while, but I feel like a lot of people don't really talk about it. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of what it is and how it can be utilized. So beginning farmer rancher benefits are available for farmers for five years after the farmer turns 18 or after he is in college, or um, if he is in the military, those years can be excluded as well. So what benefits this provides for farmers within those five years is he gets a waived administrative fee, which is $30 per county. Um, so that's completely waived, $30 per crop per county, I should say. He gets an extra 10 percentage points of additional subsidy, which can make a very large difference in the amount of premium he has to pay. And then on yield adjustment, he gets to use 80% of the yield instead of 60%. So yield adjustment is a very common option that's on a farmer's policy. And it is in place to protect you for years where you might have had a very poor yield. And so 
like if we think back to 2012 when most of the U.S. had an extreme drought and wasn't getting very high yields, instead of having a zero bushel yield in your 10-year history, farmers were able to substitute that zero for 60% of what their county T yield was. Well, beginning farmers are able to use 80%, so it's just a little bit of an extra step up um, bonus for them. Relay cropping was announced for the first time in 2022 where relay cropped soybeans could be insured under federal crop insurance. So this is on a case-by-case -case written agreement basis, depending on what part of the country you live in. And I have a map on the next slide. And so you have to prove evident, evidence of practice viability in the region, um, which could be on history or a letter of adaptability from an agronomist or a conservation professional, kind of like the written agreements we had talked about previously. And here, I'll just go to the region map. This is kind of showing the different regions and what records are required. So if you're in the region one, which I think most people on this webinar will be, you do not have to submit any records in order to achieve crop insurance coverage on those acres. And so if you want to relay crop your soybeans, plant your soybeans into an existing crop, um, you will be able to get crop insurance coverage on those acres. Double cropping expanded their coverage in 2023 for soybeans and grain sorghum. So I just wanted to go over the maps and see um, if any farmers fit into what options are available for them now. And so this allows farmers to raise two crops in one year. And so on the map on the left, you'll see that they expanded coverage for soybeans into a lot of the region um, that we're talking about right now. And so on the blue area, coverage is automatically available. You do not need to have history or submit a written agreement in order to get crop insurance coverage on those acres. And then in the green area, you have to submit a written agreement, but you do not need the three years of history in order to achieve insurance. And so you need to submit the paperwork, but you'll be able to get crop insurance coverage after that. And then the yellow area is where you have to submit a written agreement um, but you need three years of history in, or, in order to achieve that crop insurance coverage. TOGA, or Transitional Organic Grower Assistance Program, is new for 2023 and as of now has only been announced for 2023. So something for farmers to be aware of as they're going through their crop insurance coverage levels to make an election for the 2023 crop year. So what this does is it allows extra premium assistance for organic farmers. So transitional organic crops will receive an additional 10 percentage points of subsidy, which will make their crop insurance premium a little cheaper. Certified organic crops receive an additional $5 per acre premium discount. And then those that are insuring under whole farm revenue protection also receive an additional 10 percentage points of subsidy. So the crops listed on the bottom there are all the crops that are included in this discount structure which covers pretty much any crop. So almost everything is covered. Um, I want everybody to be aware of this because as you are going through your coverage elections to decide what coverage level you want to purchase for 2023, these numbers will probably not reflect on the quotes. So the premium discounts here are only going to show on the billing statement you receive in the fall. So I wanna make sure that farmers are aware as they're going through their crop insurance coverage elections now, if you're a certified organic, your premium is going to be $5 per acre cheaper than what your quote is showing. And so just be aware of that as you're making your election, because maybe you, it will make you want to go up a level to get a little bit more value out of your crop insurance policy without having to pay too much extra premium. And I believe that was all I had to cover. So I don't know if we have any questions um, in the chat box or if anybody has any questions, we will open the floor. We do have two questions in the chat. Kristen has asked, um, do organic farmers tend to use whole farm revenue versus standard crop insurance protection more often? I would say it depends on the operation. I have worked with farmers that use whole farm revenue protection because maybe they don't have the history requirement in order to get a written agreement in order to secure like a revenue protection type policy. I would say revenue protection, your standard crop insurance is always going to be the go-to, um, but organic farmers can use that whole farm revenue protection to cover crops that they either can't get insurance on or another great option for it too is to have in place in case a farmer doesn't meet specs on his crop. And so in that situation, if let's just say a farmer is planting food grade soybeans 
and he has his crops insured that way with a contract that he has in place. And then when he goes to deliver his crop in the fall, they don't meet specs and all of a sudden he's paid out at a feed grade rate rather than food grade. His whole farm revenue protection policy is going to be set up showing the value of those food grade soybeans. And then he'll, it'll also show on the revenue side that he did not get paid that full amount. And so whole farm revenue protection policy might kick in there and pay a little bit of the difference where that is the only option for organic farmers to collect based on a quality loss aspect. And so I'd say it really depends, which I think that answer is very common in the crop insurance policy world. Um, but I'd say most farmers go straight to that revenue protection and then use whole farm revenue protection if needed, either on top of it or instead. Um, another question from Kristen, what are the size of organic farms that tend to get policies? Very good question. And I'd say it varies. Um, I have some very small farmers and I have some very large as well. I, I, I have 20, 30 acre farmers on the books. And then when you get into the whole farm revenue protection side, a lot of people are managing a pretty sizable operation just on maybe two, three acres of fruit, vegetables, whatever it may be. Or if you just have livestock only on your operation, um, you're not covering a whole lot of acres, but you can still have a crop insurance policy in place. So I'd say it's all over the board. Farmers are being more and more aware of what crop insurance options are available to them. And with the high commodity prices and high input costs, they're looking more at ways to cover that. And so even the smaller farmers that maybe in the past didn't purchase crop insurance, they're now looking at getting into it just to make sure they have a little bit of revenue guaranteed on their operation. So it wouldn't be out of the norm to have a 10 or 15 acre farm purchase crop insurance. Eric has a question along those same lines. Um, he says, I'm thinking the current insurance models may not work well for diversified vegetable operations where crop types and amounts can vary from year to year. What do diversified veg growers specifically do? Yeah, I can tackle this at first. And then Sarah, if you want to join in, I am absolutely okay with that. But I think their main option is probably going to be that whole farm revenue protection, which does work very well for farmers that maybe have the same revenue every year. Um, so it really fits in with their structure well. But when they're changing what vegetables they're planting and the amounts of it, it does get a little bit tricky. But at this point, it's mainly one of the only options for them. And I don't know if you have anything to add, Sarah. Yes, so I was looking up some information and I will type it in the chat. So we do have an effort on specialty crops and that does include fruits and vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture nursery, horticulture nursery, excuse me, crops. And we have a list of individual crop insurance programs available for those folks on our website. And uh, we also, look to whole farm to take care of any other of the vegetable crops that may not be included in having their own specific policy. So we definitely have a program. Recently, we have regional office liaisons that are looking to stakeholder outreach, uh, things like that on those specialty crops. And there are some, some events that we recently had. Uh, a group went to Michigan at the end of February to talk about specialty crops there. And at the end of January, uh, folks went to Wisconsin Dells to speak about specialty crops. So that's definitely something that RMA is working on. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. RMA seems to be really keeping their ears open and they wanna hear about how crop insurance is working for farmers, what they could be doing differently. Um, I think things are going in a really good direction and they really wanna make things work for farmers. And so now is the time. Great, well, a couple more questions. Um, so as I said at the top of the webinar, OATS is primarily focused on training ag professionals, those who serve in an advisory role with farmers. Um, this question is for both Sarah and Megan. What advice would you give to an ag professional or advisor about crop insurance? In other words, what is the most important thing that they should know when they're working with organic clients? 
I can answer this first and then Sarah, you can go away with it. Um, I'd say the most important thing for them to be aware of is that crop insurance is different for organic farmers versus conventional. Contract pricing was one we touched on today. Another one is to make sure that all the paperwork is submitted timely with the organic certificate and the organic systems plan, where you don't have to worry about that on the conventional side of things. Um, I started this business because I felt like organic farmers weren't, were not very well represented in crop insurance agents. And so I wanted farmers to have a resource to go to in order to make sure that everything was on the up and up. And so I think it's very important that um, they're just aware of the differences and that they need to be working with someone, not me, but anybody that is familiar with what crop insurance looks like for an organic farmer and make sure they have all the paperwork in place and maybe just tell the farmers of the options that are available to them that are different from the conventional side. So for my, my input on this is Megan did mention written agreements and she mentioned making sure that farmers have their paperwork and that we don't want that to uh, deter from crop insurance because it is available for organics and it, we have an offer for organic and organic transitional on almost all of our crops. There are some exceptions, but largely an offer is available. So if anyone does say, well, crop insurance isn't available for me, that most likely isn't true. And another thing that, that I think is important that I run into uh, probably monthly, I get a lot of conversations with uh, producer groups. So an organic producer group will come to me and say, here, we have this problem. We think crop insurance may not be working, or we aren't having re the resources that a traditional farmer might have, and this is kind of a barrier for us. And so we suggest to them, hey, you work with your extension, work with your university, because the only way um, more published materials and more resources will be available to you is if you go out and talk to these folks and then they can do some research. They can, um, you know, get, get some more publications out there and then maybe you'll have more resources, both on paper, but that also might, uh, might help pick up some different type of agriculture equipment. There might be you know, more of a demand and need and then some more research on what equipment might work for your operation too. So then there's more resources on that side. I would agree. And I would add to that crop insurance for organic farmers looks 100% different now than it did 10 years ago. And so if a farmer is telling their advisor that crop insurance doesn't work for me, maybe they haven't revisited it in the last few years and it's time for them to go over what options truly are available rather than how it worked in the past because it has evolved immensely in the positive for organic farmers. Great, I got a, another question for you both. Um, we've talked a bit about the different reporting dates um, for crop insurance and um, in organics, sometimes we need to be adaptive during the season to what's happening uh, on the ground. We might need to plant late or to change our cropping decisions kind of later than what ha happens in conventional. Is there any flexibility um, or any routes for updating what was reported um, after those reporting deadlines in the summer? Yeah, I would say um, when farmers are making their coverage elections in the spring, they are usually having the conversation with their agent, like, this is what I plan to do. Corn, soybeans, oats, rye, whatever it may be. That does not mean that they are stuck to those plans. In order to obtain crop insurance coverage on those acres, you just have to have the crop on your policy with the coverage selected. And so you are not locked in to planting this specific field to corn. So as your plans change throughout the year, as long as that crop is still in your policy, you just report that when you're doing your acreage report that I planted this field to soybeans instead of corn. And then you are covered as long as the crop is on your policy. So there's not a whole lot to be worried about there. There's a lot of protection in place for that. On the planting date side of things, 
we do see organic farmers tend to plant later than conventional farmers. But as of now, the final planting date, which is mandated in each county and each crop in each county, is the same for both conventional and organic farmers. And so the rules on planting late change per crop, depending on what it is. But I'd say for most of them, you are still eligible to plant late and receive crop insurance, but you will take a little bit of a discount. So a lot of times it is 1% per day reduction in guarantee on your crop insurance coverage for planting late. I don't know if you have anything to add, Sarah. Yep, go ahead. No, I don't have anything, Megan. You covered you covered what I would have to say, especially with the the one percent per day reduction. That's that's really what we see. But you you know, at the end of the day, you still have coverage. So I think that is something good to have in your risk management arsenal and uh, to help mitigate risk on your farms. We do see if we have some um, ag advisors or farmers on here that work in the small grain sector, a lot of times instead of 1% per day, there's only like maybe a five or 10 day late plant period, and then it could be 3% per day. So it does vary by crop, but for the most part, most of them are 1% per day reduction. But like Sarah said, you still get coverage. It still helps you sleep at night, at least. Well, I have one final question on my list and we do still have time for audience questions. So if you have any more questions um, from the audience, do drop them into the chat and we will get them answered. Uh, final question from me. Are there any common practices that we see in organics that can cause issues for organic farmers insurability? Sarah, would you like to tackle that one? Well, so this one, <laughs> I mentioned that RMA works a lot with other, other folks. So this kind of question is more of an ag expert question. Um, if, if there is something that a producer is not sure about doing, they would need to go get an ag expert opinion, maybe reach out to their extension office or university. There may be some uh, crop advisors in their area that they can speak to and then they can bring that information to their crop insurance agent so that they know either upfront this is something that could be insured or maybe they might need to rethink uh, what they're doing on their farm. Uh, because sometimes if, if they're just, you know, kind of going in the heat of the moment and using these practices and not checking first, they may end up in a situation where it wasn't deemed a good farming practice for their area and their crop combination, and they might have some uh, some more hurdles to go through at lost time. Yeah, I would agree. I think communication up front is extremely important. Make sure everything is on the table now. Like now is the time to be having these conversations. Written agreements, I just touched on um, like if coverage is not available, but there is a whole realm of different written agreements that you can submit in order to obtain crop insurance coverage. Um, I see a lot of farmers getting held up in wanting to intercede and that is becoming more and more recognized in crop insurance and submitting written agreements is one way to get that through. Um, but one practice that I know of that is very top of mind because it's going on right now is I have a farmer that wants to plant corn into peas and you cannot plant corn into a legume so it is not allowed. And so that farmer, if he wasn't having these conversations up front and he just went ahead and did it and then had a loss on his corn, he might run into some hiccups at the claim time where potentially a claim could be denied because it was not an insurable practice. And so it's really good to just have all these conversations up front, make sure everybody's on the same page and you know what you're getting yourself into before the year even starts. Hi, Diane, I see you turn on your camera. Would you like, do you have something you'd like to ask or say? Yeah, I do. And I see some folks, uh, I see some names I recognize here. So hello, everybody. Um, I don't know if there's anyone here from other certifiers, but I'm the executive director at PCO. And um, I hear you saying clearly that perhaps this information is most useful for folks who are giving technical support to producers. Um, and just thinking, first of all, thank you. I, I learned a lot from this presentation, and I think it's something that I always have a lot of questions about. Um, 
and so just thinking ahead in terms of the usefulness of this information um, and like, you know, would you be open to doing a webinar for our clients or is it more appropriate to maybe pull folks together, like from extension and our partners and stuff to maybe hear and learn and see this information. But, but I, I do think it would be helpful for clients as well. So just, you know, wanting to move this conversation forward out of my own brain to help our clients, what do you think is the best way to approach moving this information forward to folks? Like we have an annual meeting, uh, you know, we could have you come speak there. You know, of course there are conferences and stuff, but um, you know, we have print publications and monthly e-news and that kind of thing. It's a, a lot to digest. Well, I can, I can take some of that. Um, I can answer that in part. Um, yes to everything that you've just said, you know, we've, we've got these webinars um, recorded. They'll be available on our our, our website. So those can be shared out in those newsletters and at events, we can promote them. Um, we can also organize specific webinars to specific regions that, um, you know, like for your clients, you know, we could, we could organize a specific webinar for them. We also have some additional resources that are being created as part of this RM, RMA funded project that OATS is doing. We have a fact sheet that we will be sharing out to all past participants, and that is freely, that will be freely available for you to share among your clients and stakeholders. Um, we also are putting together um, PowerPoint slide decks that are geared to be used during in-person events that would include, will include some exercises. And those are available to event facilitators to be able to use. Um, they're going to be created in a way that you don't have to necessarily be a crop insurance expert to be able to use them at your events. You know, you could have like a program manager um, deliver the content. Um, so we also have a few, um, uh, we're calling them, um, organic perspectives articles that are going to be published on crop insurance uh, that Megan is authoring that are available to share. So, you know, there, there are a lot of options for, for an organization like PCO to utilize the deliverables from this grant and this team to be able to get the word out. Best news I heard all day. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and so join our listserv. Here, I'm going to, or not our, you can join the listserv too, but join our mailing list. Um, I just sent the the link again in the chat. We will be making announcements as each of these things are published and you'll be able to grab them straight out of the email and, and put them to use. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. We, we can have a conversation. I see Kristen has unmuted. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and no Diana well. Um, along the lines of what uh, <clears throat> she was asking, um, I know I've been on another webinar with you, Megan, and Pennsylvania, I believe, is one of the states that you cover. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I was just wondering uh, for producers in Pennsylvania, should we uh, refer them to you as, a, as an agent to work with? Yeah, I'm just wondering how... How do we help them identify agents that are familiar with working with organic farmers? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say there's kind of like a list of how to find an agent. Um, one of those is there's an RMA agent locator tool and there you could kind of search all the agents in your area. Um, however, it's going to show all agents because realistically, every single crop insurance agent can also sell organic policies. So how to like differentiate the two can be kind of tricky. If you go on the database and search for organic, you're not gonna get an all-inclusive list. So the main requirements are you have to work with someone that is licensed in your state. You do not have to li live there. Um, they just have to be licensed in the state, which yes, I am, but there, I and I can easily do that, um, but there will be other resources I'm sure available as well. So I think the main reasons are word of mouth, maybe ask people who they're currently working with um, that they have a positive experience with at organic conferences, maybe in the area, is there any crop insurance agents there? Are they familiar with what organic is? And what I've heard is one of the best questions for a farmer to ask in order to interview a crop insurance agent on whether they're aware of organic crop insurance or not is, do you know what an OSP is? And leave it at that. And if they know what an OSP is, they might be able to help you out. Um, so I'd say there's, there's a lot of resources available for farmers more than just me. 
Um, I'm just working as a consultant with OATS in order to share all this information out to make sure that farmers and egg advisors and everybody on the list is aware of what options are available to them. Thank you for asking. Gotcha. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I just wanted to note, I dropped the agent locator tool that Megan was talking about in the chat. So you can click on it and explore it. And, and so you can kind of find your way around that website. All right. Any final thoughts from Megan and Sarah? I don't think I have any final like information, but just want to thank Oats for having me be part of this and be able to share the word. Um, it's always great to get the word out and make sure that everybody's aware that there are crop insurance options available and that they might be really useful for their operation. So really appreciate the opportunity. And a big thank you to Megan and to Sarah for being a part of this webinar and, and delivering such rich and deep content on this topic. Um, that is all the time that we have today. So thank you to everybody who joined today.